coffee ground emesis, and melana after prolonged hypotension. Welcome to Melana Brea Tar Pits, where history comes alive. We have saber-toothed tigers and giant ground sloths. See how majestic they are? Uh, sort of. I mean, we have some animatronics. They're not actually alive. Genetic cloning from mosquitoes preserved in amber? That's just a myth. We're not experimenting in that big white building behind you. Pay no attention to the figurative man behind the curtain. To distract you from that ominous white building, let's talk about our clinical patient. Mr. Jones is presenting looking like he's pretty sick. Just look at those vital signs. With tachycardia, that white blood cell count, and that hypotension, I'd say he's got septic shock. Sounds like they did the right thing by intubating him and getting him to the ICU. And based on the fact that he's had pretty bad pulmonary symptoms just after having the flu, I'll bet he's got pneumonia. And yep, they've got him on IV antibiotics too. But all that isn't really what the question is asking, is it? Two days after admission, he starts having black sticky stools. Gross. And his OG tube has started having black flecks that look like coffee grounds. And he's definitely bleeding. His hemoglobin has dropped significantly in just 12 hours. They also make a point of telling us that his blood pressure has remained low and he's still needing vasopressor support. I wonder if that has something to do with all this bleeding. Acute upper GI bleeding is a potentially life-threatening condition that requires prompt evaluation and diagnosis. Life-threatening means that it could cause death, sort of like this saber-toothed tiger here. Upper GI bleeding is typically divided into non-variceal and, well, variceal. Variceal bleeding is its own can of worms, so head on over to that sketch to check it out. General upper GI bleeding, on the other hand, typically presents with some combination of three similar symptoms, hematemesis, melena, or hematochesia. Hematemesis comes in two flavors. Ew. Coffee ground emesis and bright red hematemesis. Coffee ground emesis is typical of slower bleeds and appears so due to partial digestion of blood in the stomach. Assuming that Mr. Jones from our clinical case didn't have a chance to eat a bunch of coffee grounds, I think we can assume those black flecks coming out of his OG tube is this coffee ground emesis. If patients are throwing up red blood, it usually means they've either just mauled a giant sloth like the saber-toothed tiger has, or else it means that the bleed is much more brisk. In fact, lots of red blood on NG or OG suction is a pretty good indication for early endoscopy. Melina comes in one form, black tarry stool. And the smell? Oh, you'll know it. Think of scents of rusty iron mixed with C. diff diarrhea and you'll get close enough. Ugh, might throw up. Who wrote this? Like, what is with these nasty descriptions? Melina's exquisitely dark color is due to the digestion of blood as it passes through the GI tract. As such, melena is typically considered a sign of bleeding proximal to the ligament of trites, which is the transition point between the duodenum and jejunum. Is that always the case? No, but it's the classic definition and it will definitely come up at some point. So keep the ligament of trites in mind. And thinking back to our clinical case, that melena Mr. Jones is having helps us narrow down the source of the bleeding to the upper GI tract. Hematochesia, or red blood from the anus, is the switch hitter here. While most cases of hematochesia are due to lower GI bleeding, think diverticulosis, up to 10% of hematochesia can actually be due to brisk and serious upper GI bleeds. It's obviously important to differentiate the two when it comes to treatment, as performing colonoscopy is important in the workup of a lower GI bleed, but it's of little utility in the case of an upper GI bleed. Other signs and symptoms may give a clue as to how severe the bleed is. If less than 15% of the blood volume is lost, there are usually minimal symptoms and vital signs are normal. Tachycardia alone is the first sign, and it signifies more than 15% blood volume loss, and orthostatic hypotension also may begin to present at this point as well. Ew. Kid, that's, uh, not somewhere you want to go swimming. Orthostatic hypotension is a fall in systolic blood pressure greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, or a rise in heart rate greater than 20 beats per minute when changing position from lying to sitting or standing. If the patient has sustained significant hypotension or has cool, clammy skin, look out, as this could mean up to a 30 to 40% loss in blood volume and the beginnings of true hypovolemic shock. Luckily, most patients come in before it gets this bad. 
We have this information on hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock thanks to some research we're conducting on maulings by, um, lions. Well, at least we used some lion DNA to splice into their genomes where they were missing some parts. You know, from the amber. Which I can neither confirm nor deny we have possession of. For more information, check out our blood pool sketch on hypovolemic shock. Since prompt diagnosis is crucial in upper GI bleeds, it's important to recognize any risk factors the patient may have that make upper GI bleeding more likely, such as a history of peptic ulcer disease, particularly in the duodenum, which is the most common cause of upper GI bleed, by the way. Check out our PUD construction site sketch for more info on the etiology, clinical presentation, and management of PUD. We didn't get a chance to talk with Mr. Jones before he got tubed, but if we had, might we have heard a history of ulcers? We could still chat with his wife to see. Oh, uh, she said no. So, um, well, how about some less common causes? Mmm, that food truck smells great. Acute erosive gastropathy may cause upper GI bleeding. Let's remember back to our Japanese street scene of our gastropathy sketch to go over some of the causes. Critical illness, trauma, or sepsis can all lead to hypotension, which can lead to decreased gastric mucosal perfusion, and that can lead to acute gastropathy or ulcer formation, also known as stress ulcers. Ah, uh, that sounds familiar. Mr. Jones is definitely critically ill and has sepsis. Some vasopressors may also decrease planktonic blood flow and can cause decreased perfusion, and he's been on some of those too. CNS trauma and the increased vagal activation that goes along with it may also lead to the famed Cushing's ulcer, and severe burns with resultant hypovolemia can lead to Curling's ulcers. Point is, critical illness in many forms can lead to gastropathy or ulcer formation. So you have to be on the lookout for high-risk patients who all need some sort of GI prophylaxis. Hmm. Well, I don't remember our clinical case patient being on any GI prophylaxis. It actually said there weren't any other medications other than the ones listed. And none of those were a PPI or an H2 blocker. So without GI prophylaxis in this critically ill patient, we have our first answer. Let's finish our review of acute erosive gastropathy before moving on to other causes of upper GI bleeding. NSAIDs, chemotherapeutic agents, heavy alcohol use, and cocaine are all associated with acute gastropathy, usually due to their direct toxic effect on the mucosa except cocaine, which is due to mucosal ischemia from vasoconstriction. Another cause of GI bleeding is previous abdominal aorta surgery, especially open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, which can lead to aortoenteric fistula formation, which, yes, is a connection from the aorta to the bowel. Rare, but possible. And it can cause massive hemorrhage. We're talking fast exsanguination unless they can get to the OR double stat. It's also important to rule out imitators of GI bleeding. Medications such as bismuth or iron supplements can cause dark stools that can be misinterpreted as GI bleeding. That's bismuth, iron, and amber found right here at the Melina Brea Tar Pits. It's at least a million years old. That's super old. What's that? Where's the amber? Did I say amber? I didn't mention any amber. <laughs> you must have heard me wrong. We have, um, no record of, um... Please turn your attention away from the genetic laboratory in the background where certainly no amber is being processed to genetically recreate extinct animals like the majestic saber-toothed tiger. Moving right along. <laughs> don't drink the melanotar? Don't have to tell me twice. You may have to tell that kid from earlier, though. Not really sure why he was so close to the edge in the first place. The initial management of all patients with a suspected GI bleed starts with a quick run-through of the ABCs to ensure stabilization. Patients should be made nil per os, meaning NPO, and have two large bore IVs placed as a precaution if the need for rapid fluid administration should arise. Usually, at least some crystalloid is started. Oh, look. This caveman was certainly ahead of his time. He even has the first example of a calculator. It's not totally clear to me how he made that before the invention of the wheel, though. I mean, come on. He's still driving that old mammoth around. In any case, let this abacus remind you that in patients with upper GI bleeding, a hemoglobin level should be checked and rechecked in a serial manner. Although with acute bleeding, hemoglobin and hematocrit may be normal. This is because patients with acute bleeds lose whole blood, plasma included. 
So the concentration of hemoglobin and RBCs in the blood may not change for several hours as the body retains fluid to maintain perfusion pressures. Blood transfusion may also be needed, so better get that type and cross also. In our clinical case, Mr. Jones has a drop in hemoglobin, so the bleed must have started beforehand. And as with any bleeding patient, coagulation labs, including PT-INR, PTT, and platelets should be checked as well. Dilution of blood clotting factors as bleeding continues may make it harder and harder for the bleeding to stop. Fresh frozen plasma can be transfused in patients with an elevated INR from warfarin therapy or liver disease. Furthermore, FFP should be given to correct iatrogenic coagulopathy as well, as transfusion of packed red blood cells and crystalloid doesn't replace clotting factors. FFP is actually a part of massive transfusion protocols. Serum chemistry should be checked in all patients with a suspected GI bleed and can actually be a very useful diagnostic indicator. Blood from upper GI bleeding is metabolized as it transits the GI tract. Some of the urea released is reabsorbed, which elevates the measured BUN. A BUN to creatinine ratio greater than 36 is highly suggestive of an upper GI bleed, and the likelihood just gets bigger as the ratio increases. Reabsorbed urea can't be excreted as efficiently by the kidneys in patients with renal disease, including acute renal injury from hypovolemia. Urea builds up, causing uremia. Uremia may be present in patients with kidney disease and can cause uremic platelet dysfunction. In these cases, dialysis would be nice, but often can't be performed. In a pinch, desmopressin, or DDAVP, can be given to help temporarily improve the uremic platelet function. Very frequently, an NG tube will have been placed, particularly in the case of hematochesia. If a lot of blood is suctioned out, that's a good indication that there's a GI bleed. Side note, if there's just a little blood, it could be from traumatic NG placement or irritation of the esophagus or stomach mucosa from the NG tube. However, the specificity is particularly poor, meaning that if there's not blood, it doesn't effectively rule out a GI bleed. Same goes for an antiquated test called an NG lavage. So antiquated that it belongs in a museum. Like the Melina Brea History Museum. A museum that totally doesn't have any amber. But that doesn't mean you won't still hear about it. With the diagnosis of an acute upper GI bleed in hand, it's time to consider treatment. In all cases of upper GI bleed, proton pump inhibitors should be administered. Most often you'll see this as a continuous infusion, though studies have shown that intermittent IV boluses may be equally effective. PPIs are given because reduction of acid actually helps stabilize clots and stop bleeding, which is useful no matter what the cause. The next step in management depends on the patient's clinical status. You better make sure that one's definitely animatronic before shining a light in there like that. <laughs> of course they're all animatronic here. As I've said, we don't have any genetic recreations of these animals. Yet. Luckily, most patients with acute upper GI bleed or bleeding are hemodynamically stable or can be stabilized with IV resuscitation. In these cases, EGD, the gold standard for both diagnosis and treatment of upper GI bleeding, should be performed, preferably within 24 hours of presentation. And that's the second answer for our clinical case. Just a few more things to cover before we're done. If you scope a non-critically ill patient with or without peptic ulcer disease and an acute upper GI bleed, it's reasonable to assume you'll find a bleeding ulcer. With acute erosive gastropathy, however, the findings on EGD are a little different. Here's what we can expect to find when we scope Mr. Jones. Instead of focal ulceration, there tends to be multiple areas of petechial hemorrhage or erosion throughout the stomach. In some cases, especially if endoscopy is delayed, evidence of mucosal regeneration may be the only finding. Most upper GI bleeding can be treated endoscopically, usually with direct thermal coagulation or placement of hemoclips. If damage due to acute gastropathy is more widespread, it can be a little more complicated. More on that soon. Biopsies of any type are contraindicated in cases of active bleeding, even if they're indicated for other reasons. For example, testing for H. pylori. Wait till after the patient stops bleeding. The overwhelming majority of upper GI bleeding can be diagnosed with EGD. But if absolutely nothing is found on EGD, you have to look somewhere, namely the small bowel and lower GI tract. Since lower GI bleeding is much more common than small bowel bleeding, especially if the patient presented with hematochesia, 
colonoscopy should be performed for cases of GI bleeding where EGD failed to demonstrate a cause. For more on the ins and, well, mostly outs, of lower GI bleeding, check out the diverticulosis sketch. If you still come up with nothing after EGD and colonoscopy, the very last place to look is the small bowel. Small bowel bleeding, formerly called obscure GI bleeding, is a pretty uncommon source of upper GI bleeding. Nonetheless, it is possible and should be considered after negative EGD and C-scope. This camera on the suspicious-looking genetic laboratory building is meant only to remind you of our next imaging study. It most certainly is not the highest quality, state-of-the-art security possible for a secret under-the-books genetic lab. Video capsule endoscopy, VCE, in which the patient swallows a little GoPro pill cam, is usually the first line in cases of suspected small bowel bleeding. Small bowel enteroscopy is also gaining some traction, but is highly specialized and only available at large medical centers for the time being. So that kind of finishes up the slower diagnostic trail, followed when patients come in with slower, less hemorrhagic shocky bleeds. But remember, even though patients may have stable vital signs, they can still have severe bleeds requiring multiple repeated transfusions of blood products. However, while it's less common these days, patients may come in with severe hemorrhage refractory to stabilization. If a patient remains unstable despite resuscitation attempts, you can't perform EGD. It's contraindicated for unstable patients. In these cases, patients can go to angiography, which can be both diagnostic and therapeutic, as the interventionalist may be able to locate the bleeding vessel and inject it with vasopressin or a procoagulant coil to stop the bleeding. This can also be performed in cases of severe bleeding when EGD and colonoscopy fail to identify the source of the bleed. But there's still severe bleeding going on. Angiography is quite useful for identifying the bleed in these cases. However, it's important to note that if something is bleeding intermittently, meaning on and off bleeding, even if severe when it is bleeding, angiography performed during a not bleeding time will fail to identify the source. Luckily, surgery for acute upper GI bleeding is relatively rare now due to the advent of PPI therapy and advances in endoscopic therapy. However, in some cases, like massive hemorrhage or recurrent bleeding after treatment with EGD, it may be required. The type of surgery performed for upper GI bleeding is dependent on, not surprisingly, the cause of bleeding. For duodenal ulcer bleeding, which is the most common type of upper GI bleed, gastroduodenal artery ligation with gastric acid-reducing vagotomy is a common surgery that's performed. For gastric ulcer bleeding that's refractory to treatment, distal antrectomy, also with acid-reducing vagotomy, is performed. Finally, acute hemorrhagic erosive gastropathy. Because it's diffuse and because it can cause life-threatening hemorrhage, though rare, some extremely rare cases of acute hemorrhagic erosive gastropathy require subtotal or even total gastrectomy to stop bleeding. Let's sum all this tar up. Upper GI bleeding may be variceal or non-variceal in origin. Variceal bleeding is not covered in this sketch. Upper GI bleeding will present with hematemesis, melena, or hematochesia, or some combination of the three. Hematemesis may either be coffee ground from a slower bleed or bright red blood from a more brisk bleed. Melena is black, tarry stool from the digestion of blood as it passes through the GI tract. Typically, melena results from bleeding in the GI tract proximal to the ligament of trites. Hematochesia is blood coming out of the anus and is typically associated with lower GI bleeds, but approximately 10% of hematochesia can be from upper GI bleeds. Vital signs may give clues to how severe the bleeding is. Tachycardia is the first sign and indicates 15 to 30% blood volume loss. Orthostatic hypotension may also present and is defined as a fallen systolic blood pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury or more, or a rise in heart rate by 20 BPM or more when changing from supine to sitting or standing. Hypovolemic, aka hemorrhagic shock, develops when there's 30 to 40% blood volume lost, resulting in sustained and sometimes profound hypotension. The most common cause of upper GI bleeding is from peptic ulcer disease. Acute erosive gastropathy is another cause, which can be brought on by decreased perfusion to the gastric mucosa from critical illness, sepsis, or trauma. This also includes Cushing's ulcers and Curling's ulcers from major traumatic brain injury and major burns, respectively. NSAIDs, alcohol, cocaine, and chemotherapy drugs are all associated with erosive gastropathy. 
Another rare cause of upper GI bleeding is aortoenteric fistula as a complication from previous aortic surgery. Bismuth and iron may mimic GI bleeding by causing dark black stools. These should be ruled out while working up GI bleeds. For management of a patient with upper GI bleeds, they should be made NPO, have two large bore IVs placed for resuscitation, labs should be taken including serial CBCs, coagulation labs, and metabolic panels for BUN monitoring. A BUN to creatinine ratio greater than 36 make a GI bleed highly likely as blood is digested and reabsorbed as urea. FFP may be given for coagulopathy due to warfarin therapy, liver disease, or iatrogenic dilution of coagulation factors from multiple blood transfusions. Uremia may cause platelet dysfunction, particularly in patients with renal disease, and can be treated with DDAVP. An NG tube is often placed in cases of upper GI bleeding and may assist in diagnosis of GI bleeding if large volumes of blood are returned. No blood return does not rule out a GI bleed, however. Proton pump inhibitors should also be started, which decreases the acidity of the GI tract, helping to stabilize clot formation. Definitive diagnosis is made with EGD, where you can see either ulcers, which may be treated with electrocautery or placement of hemoclips, or diffuse petechial hemorrhage and erosions throughout the stomach in the case of acute erosive gastropathy, in which case treatment is more difficult. If EGD fails to identify a bleeding source, colonoscopy should be performed to rule out lower GI bleeding. If both of those fail and the patient is relatively stable, video capsule enteroscopy may be performed to evaluate the small bowel for bleeding. However, this can take 12 to 24 hours or even longer. So if a patient is unstable, angiography should be the next test of choice, where bleeding can be identified and treated with coils or injection of vasoconstricting agent. If all else fails, which is really quite rare, surgery can be undertaken. The type of surgery depends on the cause of bleeding. Duodenal ulcers that are bleeding may have ligation of the gastroduodenal artery with vagotomy for reduction of acid. Gastric bleeding ulcers may undergo distal antrectomy with vagotomy. Acute hemorrhagic erosive gastropathy may be exceedingly difficult to treat and may require subtotal or even total gastrectomy. Well, I'm gonna go check on the- Oh God, the genetically modified organisms that don't exist in government records anywhere have gotten loose. Everyone, run for your lives!